Hello, everybody. This is uh, Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, tonight, I'm continuing in the study of the book of John, and I'm going to pick up where I left off last time, starting with John chapter 9, verse 1. Uh, if you have not seen the previous studies on John, uh, they are uploaded and uh, available on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. So I, I hope you will go back and watch this from the beginning. Uh, I, I am a KJV firstist, so I will read it first in the KJV, and then I'll probably look at it in the Amplified. Sometimes uh, I find that to be helpful. All right, John chapter 9, verse 1. And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned, nor his parents, but that the works of God should be manifest in him. Uh, well, this is, uh, this is interesting in a lot of different ways, uh, because they're, they're making an assumption that the reason the man was blind was because of sin. Uh, because either he sinned or his parents sinned. And Jesus said, no, that's not the cause at all. Uh, and it says, this is so that uh, I can do what I'm going to do next, is basically what he's saying. Uh, this is here so I can show you something. And let's read this in the Amplified. It says, while he was passing by, he noticed a man who had been blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, teacher, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he would be born blind? Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but it, it, it was so, uh, but it was so that the works of God might be displayed and illustrated in him. So you have all kinds of uh, theological positions and or doctrines or could be concluded from these uh, few verses. Uh, and it, it was common in the past. Yes. No, I have to wait for you to leave. Okay. You're live on the internet, honey. You can say hi to the world now if you want. All right, there she is. You know how all the nice things I've been saying about her. <laughs> all right, so um, at this time in history, when Jesus walked, uh, uh, even before that, even we did a study on Job, uh, all 42 chapters of Job I did, I finished a, a month or two ago. And even through all the other studies we've done, we've seen throughout all of history that it was commonly believed that um, if see, people were blessed, it was because they did good. And if they, if they uh, were cursed with something like sickness or disease or poverty, it was because they did bad. And we, we know that there is a principle of reaping and sowing. And that is that, uh, uh, for example, in, if you're if you work really hard and do the right things, you're probably going to prosper. Uh, if you're lazy, you won't get out of bed and go to work. You're probably going to be in poverty and, and starving. So this is reaping and sowing, but it's it's a it's a principle, but not a law, because even in jo Job's case, he did everything right, and and he wasn't stricken with everything taken away from him and and uh, his. His family killed, his his wealth taken away, his health taken away. That, that didn't happen to him as a punishment for sin. That happened to him because he was the most righteous man in the world. So this is an illustration of it, that you've heard the saying, why is it that sometimes bad things happen to good people? So um, it, it, it is the case 
that even if you do everything right, sometimes bad things happen. But these people thought, and maybe you're watching this right now, many of the people in the world today uh, believe that if you're sick, it's because there's sin in your life or your parents' life. I know that for years I was street preaching in a wheelchair, and, and I had people come up to me and pray for me and say, well, the, the, the reason you're sick, the, re the reason you're in this wheelchair, uh, the reason you, prayers haven't been answered for your healing is because there must be some sin in your life. See, so this is something that has been commonly believed in the past and is still a big uh, popular belief today, but it's wrong. Uh, but Jesus is t saying that this person is not blind because of sin in his life or his parents. It's so that I can do this miracle, so that I can do this work. Now, a Calvinist might say, see, God's controlling everything. God made him blind for that purpose. Uh, but that's not what Jesus is saying at all. Sometimes God does intervene. He stick his, sticks his nose into our business, into our lives. He does inter intervene in the world. And he is sovereign. He is omnipotent, which means he is all-powerful. He can, he can control events in the world when he wants to. But he's, he's also sovereign in the respect that uh, he chooses not to control everything. And, and he gave us free will. And so he intervenes when he wants to, when he needs to direct things. He will uh, kind of stick his nose in and, and uh, ca cause and effect. But he's not controlling every molecule that moves in the universe, every word that comes out of my mouth, every thought in my head, every action. That's Calvinism and it's evil because it makes God the sinner. Every sin that man does, God's making him do it. Therefore, God's really the sinner. So that's that's a heresy. It's uh, turning God into a, a, a uh, evil sadist. Uh, I have a playlist titled uh, Calvinism Debunked. It's about 10 hours long. If you want to know all the problems with Calvinism, watch that playlist. I don't want to get too sidetracked on that, but this is... This is, there's so much in these first couple of verses that all these thoughts come up. Uh, so let me read on now. It says in verse four, I must work the works of him that sent me. So Jesus is saying, I've got to do the work that I was sent to do. God sent me, the father sent me to do these works and I must do them. He says, while it is day, the night cometh, when no man can work. So he's saying there is a time where I'm not going to be doing any works. And so I need to do these works in, during this time. This is the time for me to do the works. The works he's talking about is, are his mirac miracles. These are signs to prove that he is uh, God manifest in the flesh, the son of God, the savior. Uh, in verse five says, as long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. Okay, so let me read verse 4 and 5 in the Amplified. It says, We must work the works of him who, who, who uh, sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. That is, giving guidance through my word and works. So the light of the world, according to uh, the Amplified translation, says him being the light means he's he's the one that's giving us guidance uh through his words and his his works uh now verse six in the kjv says when he had thus spoken he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay and said unto him go wash in the pool of Siloam." which is by interpretation sent. Uh, he went his way, therefore, and washed and came seeing. Now, again, a lot of interesting things in these verses here. Uh, many times already, Jesus has performed miracles. Uh, the previous miracles, he never told anybody to, to uh, hear, uh, I'm going to spit in the dirt and make some mud and put it on you in order to, to heal you. Do you think it was necessary? 
for him to uh, to use his spittle and dirt and use the mud <clears throat> to be some kind of a healing salve. Salve. I don't think so. I think it was part of a theater, uh, so that uh, anybody watching, there would be no uh, way around it that cause and effect. I see Neo is here. Let me see. Uh, oh, I don't have anything buddy blocked yet. So you're right. Sorry, here, sorry right. to interrupt, brother. I was just uh, <clears throat> and just say hi. I love you. God bless in your, you and your family and everything, you know. Uh, just making sure everything's okay. No, everything's not okay. Uh, okay is for the the um, the the masses of people and the 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 world as a whole that live in a state of mediocrity. For me, I'm way beyond okay. I'm like full of joy and, and happiness and blessed assurance. So I I will never be okay. I will always be fantastic. Oh, of course, yeah. I would uh, express myself the same way. I, uh, I am so blessed that I can't believe it. I mean, I just, I can't believe it. I, I, just, I do believe it, but I mean, it is, it's very hard for me to believe that God would bless me with so many things. Uh, and he knows that I can handle them all. Because yeah. God wouldn't bless me with things that I couldn't handle. Yes. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I do, exactly. It's amazing to see things that are coming into my life now um, that I, I just, I feel so empowered by him. Like, I feel so, I feel so uh, deeply in debt to him that how can, how can I, me of all people, who am I to receive these blessings? You know, and he says to me, because I bless you so you can bless other people. You know, that's that's my purpose for you, and that's what I believe. That's what I, I want to do is bless other people from now on. Because he has done so much for me, I want to do more for other people. Hmm. You know? Well, that's, that's, that's a wonderful sentiment and, and attitude, and uh, I'm real happy to hear you say that. It, and it's, it, it is rare, even among uh, the brethren, it's rare to have people who recognize every day, every moment, how blessed we are and they recognize and count those blessings and, and are thankful, thankful every day. So I'm, I'm glad you realize that. And uh, you certainly are. And um, you're a blessing to me. And, and it, being on the, the ministry of encouragement is one of the, the great ministries. I wish more of the saints would spend their time encouraging others. Well, brother, um, absolutely. I've been listening to you on YouTube for a second. Uh, I do have to go in a minute. I was just uh, coming in to tell you hi and all that. Uh, don't let me stop you from what you're doing. Keep all going. Right. I mean, preach the gospel as much as you can. That's that makes me happy and smile all the time. So, all right, brother, I will. Uh, I will pick up where I left off, and uh, I, I'm always uh, thankful when you drop in to say hi. And all right, brother. Uh, so here in, in uh, Gospel of John, chapter 9, only in a few verses, we've already seen so much. There's so much theology and possible viewpoints, varying conclusions that people can get from these verses. And it's, it would be easy to misinterpret them, too. Uh, but let me see where I left off. Um so, yeah, uh, Jesus, it says that he took spittle, put it in the dirt, made clay, and put it on the man's eyes. And, you know, Jesus could have just spoken and that his, eye, his blindness would have been cured. He, couldn't, he could have cured him without even speaking, just thinking it, just willing it. Um, so why did he make spit, put spittle in dirt, make clay, and do this... Uh, this uh, public demonstration that was going on, it was for the public to, to say, uh, connect the dots. Obviously, the man's healed uh, because of what Jesus has done. So uh, there's no other reason I, that I can see for that because obviously Jesus doesn't have to make spittle and clay to heal the man's eyes. 
So he wants them to be able to come to no other conclusion than the, the healing was a result of what Jesus did. Uh, now let's go to, uh, let me read this in the Amplified, this particular section here. It says, verse uh, 5, uh, verse 6, I'll start there. It says, when he had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with his saliva, and he spread the mud like an ointment on the man's eyes. And he said to him, go and wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. So he went away and washed and came back seeing. So the observers obviously uh, would have to conclude that the, the, the man was blind and now he sees. And the, the only thing that could have caused that was Jesus. Let's look at verse 8 in the KJV. It says, the neighbors, therefore, and they which before had seen him, that was that he was blind and said, is not this he that sat and begged? Some said, this is he. And others said, uh, he is like him. But he said, he said, I am he. Therefore said they unto him, how were thine eyes opened? He answered and said, a man that is called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said unto me, go to the pool of Siloam and wash. And I went and washed and I received sight. So you see when these people inquire uh, uh, and he explains what happened, uh, th these people, uh, there's no way of uh, coming to any other conclusion that the, the, the giving of sight, the healing of the blind, was uh, could be attributed to nothing else but Jesus. Let me read this in the Amplified. It says, uh, um, verse, verse 8 in the Amplified says, So the neighbors and those who used to know him as a beggar said, Is not this the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, It is he. Still others said, No, but he looked like him. But he kept uh, saying, I am the man. So they said to him, how were your eyes opened? He replied, the man called Jesus made mud and smeared it on my eyes and told me, go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and I received my sight. They asked him, where is he? He said, I do not know. So just one of uh, uh, many, uh, many times now where Jesus heals someone. Uh, all these miracles, all these good things that Jesus is doing for people who need help, they need food, they need uh, healing. Uh, is Jesus doing it just because he's a, a, a kind and loving person? No. Um, it, it is a fact that Jesus loves us and, and uh he, 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 I'm sure that he's happy to do a healing, but the real reason, the, the ulterior motive uh, is, is, as he said numerous times, they keep on demanding signs and these miracles. The, the scriptures says Jews require a sign. So over and over again, Jesus is doing these miracles as signs, as proofs, as evidence of who he is. He is the promised one the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God, God manifest in the flesh. Uh, only God could do these things. So uh, this is this is really the primary reason for the miracles. Um, now let's go back to the KJV. And it says, um, uh, verse. this is verse... Uh, Verse 12, then said they unto him, where is he? He said, I know not. They brought to the Pharisees him that aforetime was blind. And it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Then again, the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He said unto them, he put clay upon mine eyes and I, and I washed and do see. Therefore said some of the Pharisees, this man is not of God because he keepeth not the Sabbath day. Oh, gee, that's just, 
I, what is your reaction to that? When you read that in the scriptures and you hear, hear this account, and the Pharisees, these uh, uh, most pious, most religious, uh, religious Jewish leaders, rather than jumping for joy and saying, hallelujah, someone's been healed. Thank God. They, they don't react that way. Their first reaction is, hey, this is the Sabbath day. How could he do any kind of work on the Sabbath? It's against the law. Okay. I mean, isn't it boggle your mind how these people could, that's where they go. That's their first reaction to this miracle. Okay, so back to the scriptures. Um, uh, verse 15. Then again, the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He said unto them, he put clay upon mine eyes and I washed it and do see. Therefore said some of the Pharisees, this man is not of God because he keep not the Sabbath day. Others said, how could a man that is a sinner do such miracles. And there was a division among them. So not everybody was a uh, legalist, uh, a self-righteous judge. Uh, some people were uh, responding, you know, the way you should respond. Wait a second. He's doing these miracles. How, how could he be a sinner and do these miracles? Verse 17 says, they say unto the blind man again, What sayest thou of him, that he hath opened thine eyes? He said, He is a prophet. But the Jews did not believe concerning him, that he had been blind and received his sight, until they called the parents of him that had received his sight. And they asked them, saying, Is this your son, who ye say was born blind? How then doth he now see? His parents answered them and said, We know that this is our son, and that he was born blind. But by what means he now seeth, we know not. Or who hath opened his eyes, we know not. He is of age, ask him. He shall speak for himself. Then in verse 22, you understand why his parents answered in that way. These words spake his parents because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had agreed already that if any man did confess that uh, Jesus, that he was the Christ, he should be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, said his parents, he is of age, ask him. So they, they knew what was going on. They know that uh, it was a, a witch hunt against against Jesus. Jesus has said over and over again, that you seek to kill me. And uh, they seek to trap him. And uh, now they're trying to find some way of condemning him. And doing it, according to their laws, you can't work on the Sabbath. Now, the, the Sabbath was given to the Jews so they could rest, they could relax and not have to uh, do any work. And they could just focus on God and family and, and uh, take a day of rest. But Jesus says the Sabbath was not for God, to please God. It was for man's benefit. So these religious Pharisees had it backwards. They thought this was a legalistic requirement to satisfy God. But no, Jesus, no, God gave us the Sabbath for our benefit so we could just rest. But doesn't mean you have to, if there's something that needs to be done, like healing the blind. Um, let me read this in the Amplified and see if the, there's any additional insights we get from it. Um, first, starting with verse 18. However, the Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the man's parents 
uh, they asked them, is this your son who you say was born blind? Then how does he now see? His parents answered, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind. But as, as to how he now sees, we do not know. Or who has opened his eyes, we do not know. Ask him and stop asking us. He is of age. He will speak for himself and give his own account of it. His parents said this because they were afraid of the leaders of the Jews. For the Jews had already agreed that if anyone acknowledged Jesus to be the Christ, he would be put out of the synagogue, that is, excommunicated. Because of this, his parents said, he is of age, ask him. So there's already a conspiracy uh, uh, going on where they're scheming to entrap Jesus and condemn him. And... Uh, um, everybody knows what's going on. Um, now, verse 24 in the KJV says, Then again called they the man that was blind and said unto him, Give God the praise. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered and said, Whether he be a sinner or no, I know not. One thing I know that whereas I was blind, now I see. Then said they to him again, what did he, what did he to thee? How opened he thine eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and ye did not hear. Wherefore would ye hear it again? Will ye also be his disciples? Then they reviled him and said, thou art his disciple but we are Moses' disciple, disciples. We know that God spake unto Moses. As for this fellow, we know not from whence he is. The man answered and said unto them, Why herein is a marvelous thing, that ye know not from whence he is, and yet he hath opened mine eyes. You see this, this beggar uh, that... That he, he should not be able to reason and um, uh, debate, uh, and hold his ground against these learned, educated Pharisees, and yet he's answered them and he's making them look foolish. Uh, let me read this. Uh, verse 31 says, now we know that God heareth not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. Oh, that's still the beggar speaking. Since the world began, was it not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind? That's right. Verse 32, uh, there is no Old Testament record of any blind person being healed. So this verse is true. Not one record in the Old Testament of anybody being born blind and then they, they're healed. They can see. Now, do you know anybody today? Of all the people who claim they have the gift of healing today, do you know of any cases that can be proven that they were born blind and now they have perfectly healthy eyes and perfect vision? If that was the case, they should be on the news of all the big news channels every day and, and telling the world how this is possible and so that more people can benefit. And if, if there were, are these healers that can really do that, why aren't they going to hospitals every day and healing everybody in the hospitals? Why aren't they causing the amputated limbs to, to grow back? Why aren't they uh, causing the eyes that have been uh, lost in, uh, in, uh, severe bodily injuries and they've lost their eyes for the eye to be back in place and working again. These are the kinds of things that Jesus did. But these people who claim to be healers today, they have the gift of healing. It's all fraudulent. Now, again, if you can, if you can give me any examples of, of people that are doing real healing like Jesus did today, if that's happening, let us all know. And if that is the case, then uh, we want to contact all the media and let the world know. Uh, 
Uh, let me read this portion in the uh, Amplified. It says, it says, So a second time they called the man who had been born blind and said to him, Give God glory and praise for your sight. We know this man, Jesus, is a sinner separated from God. Then he answered, uh, I, I do not know whether he is a sinner separated from God, but one thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. So they said to him, what did he actually do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered, I already told you, and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again and again? Do you want to become his disciples too? And at that remark, they stormed at him and jeered, you are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know for certain that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he is from. The man replied, well, this is astonishing. Uh, you do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know according to your tradition that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone fears God and does his will, he hears him. Since the beginning of time, it has never been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he would not be able to do anything like this because God would not hear his prayer. They answered him, you were born entirely in sins from head to foot, and you presume to teach us? Then they threw him out of the synagogue. So they're so full of self-righteousness, they couldn't. They're not going to learn from this beggar who's so beneath them. And yet, you see, he's the one that's wise among them. Uh, so let me read this now. Uh, verse 35 in the KJV says, Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And when he had found him, he said unto him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? He answered and said, who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? Now, if I understand this correctly, the man could not see. Jesus put the a mud on his eyes. He walked away uh, to the, the, the pool. So um, he never saw what Jesus looked like. Now, he heard him. So it's possible he could recognize the voice of Jesus, but he hadn't seen him because he was blind. And then he went to the pool, washed, and now he can see, but Jesus is gone at this point. So it looks to me, it seems to me, this is the first time he's actually able to see Jesus. And so he answers and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast, hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. So Jesus is saying, It's me. I am the Son of God. He said, Thus, in verse 20, 35, it says, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? And then Jesus says, uh, It is he who that talketh with thee. So Jesus says, I am the Son of God. Another claim of, of deity. Um, my son is human because I'm a human. So he's human. And he's completely human, 100% human, just as much human as I am. And so... Uh, the Son of God is completely God, equal to God, just like my Son is equally human to me. Uh, so when, it, when you claim that you are the Son of God, the Jews know what that meant. That's why they wanted to kill him. It was a claim that he is God himself. Uh, verse 38, and he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. Now, he, the man says, I believe. Jesus says, I'm the son of God. He says, yes, I believe. So he believed Jesus is the son of God, and he worshiped him. Now, you're not supposed to worship a person or an idol or, or an angel. Um, examples in the scriptures where we find angels talking to people and someone falling down and worshiping, the angels quickly say, don't, you can't worship me. I'm, I'm a messenger. I'm an angel. I only worship God. Peter and Paul uh, both have occasions where their people start worshiping. They said, no, don't worship me. I'm just a man like you. But Jesus does not correct him and say, don't worship me. I'm just a man. Worship God. He doesn't correct him. He accepts the worship. 
Verse 39, and Jesus said, for judgment I am come into this world that they which see not see not might see and that they which see might be made blind. And some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words and said unto him, are we blind also? Jesus said unto them, if ye were blind, ye should have no sin. But now we say, um, now ye say, we see, therefore your sin remaineth. So the, the, these Pharisees are just digging a deeper and deeper hole for themselves, <coughs> <coughs> burying themselves in their self-righteousness. Let me read these final verses in the Amplified. Verse 39, then Jesus said, I came into this world for judgment to separate those who believe in me from those who reject me, to declare judgment on those who choose to be separated from God so that the sightless would see and those who see would become blind. Some Pharisees who were with him heard these things and said to him, are we also blind? Jesus said to them, if you were blind to spiritual things, you would uh, have no sin and would not be blamed for your unbelief. So if you just don't know better, it's one thing uh, because you're just blind to it. But if you're supposed to understand spiritual things and refuse to accept them, that's when you're guilty, he's saying. But he says, but since you claim to have spiritual sight, you have no excuse. So your sin and guilt remain. Okay, that's the end of chapter nine. Uh, I'm going to uh, make a couple of well, a couple of minutes here to tell you the good news about salvation, uh, and then we'll we'll pick up next time with chapter ten. But you you could study the Bible from cover to cover and learn, uh, you know, the about the lives of all the people, the history of the nations. You can learn all kinds of theological ideas and principles and doctrines. But if you do not get the one thing that is essential out of the Bible, then it would be a shame and a waste of time. The one thing that is of utmost importance is that you learn about salvation and you understand that salvation and eternal life in heaven is offered to all of mankind as a free gift from Jesus Christ. Now, if this idea is foreign to you, I'm not surprised by that because almost all the people in the world today, even people attending church every Sunday, uh, they do not understand that salvation is a gift. It's not something you work for and earn through your good behavior, your ability to stop sinning and your ability to do good deeds. That's what most people attending church, most people in all the religions of the world, that's what they believe. They think salvation is attained through effort, uh, good works. And if you do good enough, God says, okay, that was good enough. You're saved. You get to come to heaven. But the Bible says that no, that's man's way, but that's not God's way. God's way is Salvation is a gift from Jesus Christ to anyone who will accept it. Now, I'm going to tell you why man's way won't work. Um, because the Bible tells us that if you want to be judged based upon your life, like say, God, put my life on a scale. Put my good deeds on one side and my bad deeds on another. And you'll see that I'm a pretty darn good person. The scale is going to tilt like that. I'm... I'm a good person. Well, the, the problem with that is that the Bible tells us the standard you've got to meet is 100% good and zero bad. You've got to be perfect. Were you aware of that? The, the, the Bible says that uh, we, we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Everybody has sinned. Now, I know that some people sin more than others. And I know there's all kinds of different varieties of sins. You might think, well, that sin's worse than my sin. But it's not the variety of sin. It's not the number of sin. It's just the fact that we're all sinners and we, 
none of us can go before God and say, I'm perfect. I lived a whole life, never did one thing wrong, never even had one bad thought. Now, if you think you can go before God and make that claim, then go ahead, try it. But Jesus said that it is impossible to get to heaven that way. That's why his apostles were said, well, Lord, based on what you've been telling us, how then is it possible for anyone to be saved? And Jesus said, with man, it is impossible. That's why you need to understand, trying to get to heaven through your own efforts, through your self-righteousness is impossible. Give up on that. Put your hands up, say, I surrender, I give, I'm, I'm defeated. I know that it's futile, I can't do it. That's why you, you need to come to that conclusion. And only then will you say, I need to be saved. I need someone to do it for me because I can't do it. And I need, the only one that can do it is God because the Bible says, only God is the Savior. The Bible says Jesus is the Savior. Jesus is the Savior God. So uh, the Bible says that rather than working and earning salvation, you receive salvation as a free gift. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The gift of God is eternal life. Jesus is offering you a spot in heaven in eternity as a gift. If you want it, it's that easy. Just trust Jesus, accept the gift, and don't put your faith in yourself. Instead, put your faith in him. Trust him. Now, you need to know who he is and what he's done to understand how this works. The Bible says he is eternal God Almighty. The Bible says he came down from heaven. It says that he became a man. He was manifest in the flesh as the son of God. The Bible says the reason he became a man was in order to die. The Bible says he had to die to pay for our sins. The Bible says he was buried and on the third day he was raised back to life. This bodily resurrection was the sign that he promised to prove his claim to were true, that he is God, he is savior. He does have power over life and death. Now. When he was raised from the dead bodily, he walked among 500 witnesses for 40 days. They saw him, they talked to him, they touched him, they ate with him. And it's that resurrection that gives us the confidence that our faith in Jesus is justified. Put your faith in him now and he will give you eternal life in heaven. And once you put your faith in him, it's irreversible, it's irrevocable by God or by you. Isn't that wonderful? In other words, Jesus says, if you trust him, you're guaranteed you're going to go to heaven. Guaranteed. And because it's a promise from God, you can trust it because the Bible says God can't break a promise. God can't lie. Trust Jesus now. And then make a comment on this video. Let me know that today's the day you called on the name of Lord Jesus. Jesus, you're my Savior. Join me night for, me for these live broadcasts. Uh, Bible Talk with Brother Luke, nightly, 7 p.m. Pacific time. Bless you in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.